So now let's see if we can prove the main claim that we had in the previous video. So we have this randomized algorithm where the constraints are randomly shuffled and we want to claim that the probability that a step 3.2 runs is at most 2.i. Okay. Uh, before going to the proof, let's study what the step 2 does because that's actually the main thing that helps us prove this. Step 2 is shuffling constraints. Now the question is, if you have n constraints, so here 9 constraints, 1, 2, up to 9, how do you shuffle them? Or how do you randomly permute them? There are a number of different strategies. So for example, one way to randomize them is to place i, like run an i for loop from 1 to 9, and then place the i element in the random non-empty spot. So for example, you take 1, you place it in a random place, you take 2, place it in a random place, and then similarly fill the rest. The next thing you could do that will achieve the same thing is to fill the i spot randomly. So start from the first location, pick a random element and put it there, let's say three, and then look at the second location, pick a random element and put it there, seven, and so on, okay? And obviously these two are equivalent, in other words, they both will randomly shuffle the constraint. But now let's go something a bit, you know, it's different. So let's say I do this step but this time, instead of filling from left to right, I fill from right to left, right? So I filled the i-to spot randomly, but starting from the last location. So I look at the last location, put a random element four, and then the previous one, seven, and so on. And it turns out that if I look at the shuffling of the constraint as if they were shuffled like this, this can help me a lot. This might sound a bit strange that, um, that why thinking of shuffling as being done differently will help us, but the, the reason will be clear in a moment. So just to reiterate, assume that the constraints, this is step two, the constraints are shuffled using this code. Okay. So let's see how does that help. So assume that the constraint um, that I've, uh, that I've um, the constraints i plus one up to n have already been filled by random constraints. Okay. So in other words, if I look at the position of the constraint, I have already made some random choices for i plus one up to n. And then I want to slightly strengthen this claim. So this claim holds, this claim says that in overall, the probability of step 3.2 running is 2.i. Here I want to make it a bit stronger. I want to say that regardless of the choices that I've made for the constraints i plus one up to n, this claim holds. Okay, if I sh could prove this, then my um, claim follows. So this implies this. If you want to be much more mathematically precise, then you have to use conditional random variables, uh, law of total probability, and and so on. But I think the claim is very intuitively obvious. So I'm not going to add too much probability theory to this because it's somehow obvious that um, if, if the claim holds no matter what I put at position i plus one up to n, then it will hold in general, okay? But you can make this mathematically precise as well. Okay, so now instead of proving this main claim, we want to prove this blue claim over here. So let's focus on this. So imagine that I look at the constraints one to i, right? So, I have, so let me rephrase this, this um, claim. For the choice of constraints i plus one up to n, these choices have been made, have been already filled in. So what is missing here is the choice of constraint i. And obviously the i iteration of this algorithm does not depend on the choice of constraint i plus one up to n. In other words, we don't really care about this. If I have a fixed set of values, or I have a fixed set of constraints from um, for the constraint one to i, um, that only depends on the, that fixed set. It doesn't depend on the order of the constraint i plus one up to n. Right. So this is independent of the order of the constraints i plus one up to n. Okay. So we focus only on constraint one to i. And let's say these constraints are look like this and they create a feasible region like this. 
and uh, they forbid this gray piece of the plane. Okay, so now the random procedure that fills out the constraint has to make a choice about the constraint number i. So from these constraints, it will pick one constraint to be at position number i. Let's say it picks this one. So this is at position number i. If that's the choice of constraint for constraint number i, will that make the algorithm run at the step 3.2? No, because if this is the choice of constraint number i, this constraint does not validate v, so therefore we are at the step 3.1. Similarly, if this was a last constraint, that means that if I look at constraint 1 up to i minus 1, the feasible region look like this, and then I added this, you know, at that cut off that piece of the feasible region. Again, I don't care because both that constraint still satisfies v, so I'm still at step 3.1. The only problem is if one of these two constraints that are adjacent to v were selected as the last constraint. If one of them were constraint number i, then when I, if I go back to constraints i1 up to i minus 1, then the feasible region would be different. It would not have this v at the boundary, right? So but the answer could potentially be different. So therefore, um, the probability that step 3.2 runs is equivalent to the probability that one of these two constraints were chosen as the i constraint. So what is the probability that we pick two out of i constraint at position number i? Well, that is obviously two point i. So the probability that the, either of the two problematic constraints were selected as a constraint number i is at most two point i. So therefore, this probability is at most two point i. And therefore, that probability is at most two point i. So therefore, we have proven the main backwards analysis, the claim of the backward analysis, and then we've done with the analysis.